Greetings to all my listeners and viewers in the precious name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray that the grace and peace and love and joy in all the beautiful fruits of the Spirit will be all upon all of you as you study and pray and seek the face of the Most High God. Today I wanted to uh, revisit a topic on which I've made many videos in the past, which is the subject of evil as to why evil exists. All these topics are related basically to, to uh, they, they lead back to one, okay, one being and one subject, which is God and his purpose, okay. That the Bible tells us, you know, as I just taught in my free will versus predestination videos, that uh, all things were made by God and they were made for God. That all things have been purposed by God and they have been created to serve his purposes. And again, in this purpose, of course, comes what happened in the Garden of Eden. Okay, the Garden of Eden story where we read about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it's a very, very misunderstood one. And I want to today, you know, just take a few minutes and I'm going to play one of my old videos for you after this. But I just wanted to again, like, you know, just update this information a little bit. And essentially, like, you know, looking at the screen, you can see here that this person, you know, I got this graphic. And uh, this is generally the teaching about these two trees that were in the garden, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This is the way that most preachers, or I would say all teachers out there, preachers, this is what they're saying. The tree of life in this one, as it is shown, that it is called the Spirit of God. It shows that the stem is the Spirit of God and the root is God, okay? Which is good because that is true, because God is life. So yes, the tree of life is God. There's no doubt about that. But on the, on the other hand, when you look at the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it shows the stem as the spirit of Satan and the roots as Satan. Is this really true? And, you know, it's very easy to disprove that this is not true. What this person and what these people teach you about this tree is not true. You have learned nothing truth in this because you can prove these teachings false by simply looking at the name of the tree. The tree, tree, tree was called the tree of knowledge of good and let's leave it at that. The tree of knowledge of good. Let's leave it at that. Let's not talk about the evil part right now. But if it was just called the tree of knowledge of good, would everybody be running around saying that this is evil? Would this person who called this tree Satan, when it clearly tells you that it's the tree of knowledge of good, and what did Jesus say? There is none good save one that is God. Jesus called God good. So if it was the tree of knowledge of good, is that not the tree of knowledge of God? So how then can somebody tell you that the root of this tree is Satan? It can't be, right? Because it's the tree of that brings you the knowledge of God. Okay, I'll get to the evil part and what relationship it has, that why it had to be related or it had to be connected. The knowledge of good had to be connected with the knowledge of evil and how that works. But this disproves all of the teachings. Just the name of the tree disproves everything that you have ever heard about the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Everybody tells you it was such a bad thing that happened. Man ate the fruit rose oh, so bad. Or oh, man became his God so bad. No, none of that is true. All those teachings, throw them out. And let's go back to the Bible. And let's see what the Bible has to say about this very significant event that took place in the Garden of Eden. Why God planted the tree. And uh, did man eating the fruit actually serve the purposes of God? And was that the right thing that happened in there, even though it brought some very bad consequences, especially death? But was that something that needed to happen to serve the purposes of God? And the answer is, uh, is a resounding yes, it did. See, people don't understand that uh, God does whatever he does, he does it with reason. God said he's made all things by wisdom. There's nothing that God has ever done that is without forethought or without actually is serving a purpose for him. Especially in regards to this tree of knowledge of good and evil, this purpose was not a small one. It is because of this tree 
that brought man the knowledge not just of evil, which everybody talks about, like this graphic here, oh, spirit of Satan, oh, Satan. No, it also brought the knowledge of God. It brought the knowledge of good. Because man could understand good and evil now, after eating that fruit, that man would become a creature of conscience, and therefore he would be a God-like being. He would not be just mankind. He would now be able to understand God because without a conscience, which is what the understanding good and evil brings, man would only be a robotic, computer-like creature, a living soul, but not a living spirit, which is what God is, okay? God is more than just a consciousness. Man, when he became a living soul, was a consciousness, but he was not a conscience. God is a living consciousness with a conscience that he differentiates between good and evil, okay? He understands the difference between right and wrong, between life and death. Man could not understand any of those things unless he ate that fruit of the tree. And this is how God planned it. God planned before the foundation of the world for him, for man and the woman, to eat that fruit so that they would then not be robots anymore. See, they were robotic in the sense that they understood the natural world. They understood they had knowledge of trees, the garden, the animals, etc., food. Okay, they could understand that, that he could even communicate with God. But they couldn't look into the heart of God because God is good. And without understanding what good means, they only would ever have a superficial relationship. And that is not what God created them for. God created them to have a perfect relationship with him. In order to have that perfect relationship, he had to make them perfect by bringing them the perfect knowledge of good. So this tree, this graphic, which is showing you that this is the spirit of Satan and it's Satan, the root. No, the real graphic should be this tree should be divided in half. A one half would represent Satan and evil, the other half would represent God and good, okay? The one part of the tree that man needed to understand was God and good. But sadly, that knowledge cannot come without also understanding Satan and evil. So they had to be given both. They had to be given the knowledge of good, the knowledge of God, but they also had to have the knowledge of evil, the knowledge of Satan. So having established that although it is very commonly taught that this tree was the tree of the knowledge of evil and they miss people, you know, most preachers miss that good part altogether or they leave it out of it altogether. No, the tree was first of all the tree of the knowledge of good, okay? The purpose of this tree was to bring man the knowledge of good. Knowledge of good and evil is not something that you read in a book, okay? It wasn't that they ate the fruit and suddenly, boom, they know everything that's good and they know everything that's evil. No, what that means is that now they would begin to experience both evil and good, okay? That bringing the knowledge of evil would actually make them evil, which is why they would die. That's what the warning was. People say, you know, God punished them with death. No, death was not a punishment. Death was a consequence. God simply told them that you eat this fruit, you are going to become evil, and when evil enters in, you are going to die. That was the warning, okay? It was a consequence, but this is a consequence that could not be avoided, okay? It had to happen that way, which is the reason why God had already provided the solution. What was the solution? Behold the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. God knew death was going to come, God said, no, that once death comes and gets a hold of man, man is never going to be able to free himself, so I'm going to have to do it. But it is necessary that they understand good and evil. Otherwise, you know, I can never have a full relationship with them. Otherwise, they, could be, they might as well be just one of the animals. That's not why I'm creating them. I'm creating them to be my image. And in order to be my image, image means character. It means knowledge. It means something that... Uh, uh, has to be imprinted on the inside of a person. Like God said, I will put my laws into their minds and I will write them in their heart and then I will write them in their heart and I will put them in their minds. 
So all this knowledge had to be programmed into man, and it would be programmed by man experiencing both evil and good. So the basic understanding of this tree, why? The God doesn't do anything without reason, okay? Not even a breath of wind blows on this, uh, on this, in this, in creation that does not serve God's purposes. So let alone this important, one of the most significant events ever in the history of creation, this uh, event that happened in the Garden of Eden, that God would plant this tree without any reason, without planning it, without purposing it. Of course he did, okay? So the real purpose of this tree was the knowledge of good. It was not so much the knowledge of evil, my friends. It was the knowledge of good. Okay, good and life. These two trees together, like we read in Deuteronomy 30, 19, is, you know, that I set before you life and good. They are connected. So these trees were connected by something not just all bad. It was actually good. Because God is saying is that once you have the knowledge of good, then you will have the knowledge of life. Okay? Now, the only way to bring that knowledge is to bring the knowledge of the opposite. For example, light and darkness. You know, when the when the dark when light came, God said, "Let there be light." Okay, and then God saw the light and He said that it was good. But why, how how would we know that it was good? It would be we could understand that light was good because darkness existed. Now you could compare the two, and you could say, "Okay, oh man, darkness you know is horrible, but light is good." Okay, same thing with life. Life itself only the value of life will only become valuable life would become valuable only when death existed. Okay, without death, life really has no value. Then, you know, nobody can value it until and unless it has been deprived of something, okay? Same thing, the opposites. Like, you know, when something is cruel and somebody is kind, then you understand that what kindness means. When somebody does something wrong, like Adam and Eve, and God, you know, instead of judging them, and destroying them right in the spot, which is judgment. No, he exercised mercy towards them. He clothed them with coats of skin. He made it possible. He had already planned that, you know, the Lamb of God would be slain from the foundation of the world, from of the world to save these, these this race from the consequences of their action. So that proved to us that God is good. Ultimately, this understanding of good would lead us to the ultimate understanding that God is love, okay, which could only be shown to us on the cross through death. God so loved the world that he gave, that giving part, that he gave his only begotten son, that giving. God so loved the world that he died because of that love. As we read in John, 1 John 3.16, hereby perceive you the love of God that he laid down his life for us. That God says, I love you so much that I'm going to give you the most precious thing I have, which is my own life. And that was only possible in the presence of death. So all these things had to happen. They were planned by God. The only question is, the question is not whether what happened with them eating the fruit of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, was that something that served a purpose for God, a good purpose, okay? No, the only question we need to ask is, then why did God give them a, the command not to eat that fruit. If God wanted them to eat that fruit, why would he command them not to eat it? That is a good question. So we read in Genesis 2.17, God gave this command to Adam. And it's important that God didn't give this command to Adam and Eve both. He just gave it to Adam alone. And uh, why that's important is something may I may or may not cover in this video. But anyhow, this is Genesis 2.17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Okay, first of all, as I have explained already, this was not a punishment. God was not going to punish them with death if they would eat that fruit. Okay, if that was their punishment, they would have never been liberated from it. Okay, God gave them a warning. That what's going to happen is, which is, there's this warning they could not understand. It's like, you know, if you tell an infant, okay, don't put your hand on a hot stove. Okay, if he's never done it before, he does not understand what you're talking about. And it's not until he actually puts his hand and burns his hand that he will understand it, okay? And that's exactly what God was doing here was he was warning them. He said, you know, you eat this fruit, 
what's going to happen is evil is going to enter into you and then it is going to slowly kill you because that's what evil does in the end it destroys the host okay that's what was the warning of god to them that don't eat this fruit because it is going to bring with it a very serious consequence and you are not going to be able to free yourself from it and when he gave them that the, the this warning that you shall not you shall surely die you know they hadn't seen death all they had was a very good life you know in a beautiful garden where you know they didn't have to do anything and it was full of these beautiful trees they were all good for food you know and you know and they're both like uh, enjoying life there how would they understand what death meant so this this warning really had no meaning for them okay and this is the reason why god understood that this would not you know have any meaning for them but yet it was necessary that they eat this fruit because without it evil and death will not understand enter this world and without evil and death and entering this world god could never show his goodness and ultimately his love for man to them and therefore man and him could never have a relationship of equals where having understood god's love man in turn will love him back equally as much as his creator loves the creation so now we can understand that the tree being the tree of the knowledge of good and god and god being good that without that understanding that fruit without actually gaining the knowledge of good man could not have a knowledge of god okay he could only know him superficially not in his heart not as in, in his inside and he could never have a mature adult relationship with him a relationship based on love it was not possible so therefore it was necessary the man should eat this fruit and because this tree was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil it wasn't called the tree of the knowledge of good or evil if in the knowledge of evil and good and good and evil can be separated so that you could gain the knowledge of good without having to understand evil then uh, the the tree of evil would not even have existed but incredibly like i told you before that the knowledge of good cannot be understood without unless we compare it to evil so the problem is that once man ate that fruit then and disobeyed god evil would enter into them and they would become evil and that became very very obvious like you know cain kills abel within like eight generations the earth is so corrupt and so filled with violence that it grieves god deeply at his heart it was like somebody was taking like you know like on the cross of jesus is like the roman soldier pierced him with a spear and that's how the genesis 6 reads you know that there was all these like th- sharp spears were being were piercing god's heart seeing all that man was doing on the earth that was all a consequence of the evil yet god had decreed that this price would need to be paid without which man could never be elevated to the level of god okay man therefore would always remain man he could never become that new creature which would be the sons of god that would have a relationship with him as a parent does with his offspring once the offspring matures and grows a man grows up then you know he becomes an adult he can have a relationship with his father and mother as equals they can talk to each other they can relate to each other or a man and his spouse you know they can have a relationship of understanding that's the type of relationship god wanted with man and in order to bring that relationship to fruition he had to make sure that they ate that tree ate that fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and regrettably eating that would also bring the knowledge of evil it would make evil enter into this world into the heart of man it would make man evil it would kill man and man could never save himself therefore a savior would need to be provided and man would need to be rescued from this okay but in so doing god would prove to him the full extent of his love god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son then it became possible that god could give the ultimate price he could say to man man look at this i don't love you so much that i'm going to give you beautiful fruit trees to eat fruit no i love you so much that i'm going to take my very heart and i'm going to let it be ripped out of my so that to prove to you that my love is so great that i cannot bear to see you die i am going to take that punishment on me i am going to suffer that consequence which belongs to you myself 
because I love you, okay? And when that sort of type of love is like a parent who has a child who needs, uh, you know, some organ, for example, let's say a kidney, and this parent only has one kidney, and he says, okay, no worries. Take my kidney. It's a perfect match with my child. Let my child live, and I will die, okay? That one act is going to prove the parent's love, the father's love more to the child than if the parent brought, bought him all the wealth in this world, gave him the Mercedes and, and, and Ferraris and mansions and airplanes and whatever. If the parent gave all that to the parent, to the child, it would mean nothing. All the rich people, if, 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 if love could be proven by material things, all the kids that of rich parents would love their parents, you know, so much. It doesn't happen, does it? In wealthy families, usually it's the opposite, that there's more conflict. There is less love, okay? Because love is not proven by material things. Love is proven by giving of life. Okay, greater love is no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friend. Life is the ultimate, ultimate value of love. Okay, in, in the Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 8, we read, Love is strong as death. The maximum, the maximum magnitude of love can only be proven through death by dying for someone. That is the ultimate proof of how much love that is the giving of all of love, okay? There's no more love that can be given than by giving your life. And all that would only be possible if man was to eat that fruit, okay? And again, still we haven't answered the question, but then why did God command him not to eat it? Sorry, I just quoted the Song of Solomon and I said chapter 6, verse 8, when it's the other way around. It's actually chapter 8, verse 6, which says, uh, set me, 7 and 8, set me as a seal upon thine heart as a seal upon thine arm, for love is strong as death. Jealousy is cruel as the grave, the coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath a most vehement flame. So, you know, love's measure is death, okay? When love, when somebody gives their life, that means they have given all of their love, and that's what God did. There was no possible way for the God to give that much love to Adam and Eve in the garden, and there was no possible way for them to understand it, that is why these things happen the way they happen. Like I told you, God is sovereign. He does everything according to his purposes, and he does everything according to his wisdom and understanding. All this was all planned long before anything ever came into existence. So don't think that what happened in the Garden of Eden was an accident and that God went about to correct it. No, everything happened in there exactly the way he planned for it to happen. So now it has become clear that, you know, eating that fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good was not just something that had evil as its end, okay? At the end of it actually was something good that it brought man the knowledge of good, good, the knowledge of God, especially the knowledge of his love, which could never have happened unless death had not come into this world. Now, so it is obvious that it was necessary for man to eat from this fruit to serve the purposes of God. But there were two ways that God could make sure that man would eat this fruit. One was by telling man, go ahead and eat this fruit because you need this knowledge. Now, if God had done that, man would still have become evil. Man would still have become subject to death. But now, under these circumstances, man would then have told God, God, this is your fault. You told us to eat it. Therefore, you are responsible for our death. Therefore, you need to go ahead and fix it. And God could have still have fixed it by dying for man. But this would not have been a proof to man that God loved him. Okay, man would have said, yeah, you died. So what? It was your fault, right? So this would have taught man nothing. But on the other hand, and at the same time, God would be telling someone to go ahead and become evil, which would mean that, you know, there would be a flaw in God if he did that, Okay. There would be some evil in God himself, which is not possible. He cannot tempt man. He said he tempts no man with evil. Therefore, he would not ever let that happen. So therefore, the other way that God could make sure that this was going to happen was by giving man 
the commandment not to eat the fruit, okay? But by the same time, giving him a nature that was the nature of curiosity, the nature that wanted to understand and become more than he was, but at the same time, giving him the warning of the consequences that if he did this, there are going to be some very serious consequences, that death is going to come. And man, of course, did not understand what that meant. But because he disobeyed God and he went ahead and did it, and all the evil entered in, death entered in, now when God went about to rectify the consequences of man's own actions, man himself was to blame for what happened. Okay, Now man could see that he had allowed death to come in, that he had allowed this evil to come in, that he himself would not be able to extricate himself from this dilemma. Therefore, he would need a savior. Okay? And because man would become evil, he would no longer be lovable. He would not be a creature that would be lovable because he was so good. No, it was quite the opposite. He was very unlovable. Yet under those circumstances, God would still love him. And loving him, he would do everything, including and up to giving of his own life to save him. And thereby God would demonstrate the full magnitude of his own love to man. And then man would gain the understanding, which is the full knowledge of God. So although man had to eat that fruit, it was also necessary that man should do so by his own choice, okay? So that he would be responsible for his actions and not God. And that is why God gave him the only commandment that would make sure that in the end it would be man's fault and God could not be blamed for it, okay? Although God planned it, but the consequences that would come, man would still be saved from them and at the, in saving them, God would prove to man, would demonstrate to man, would show him, hereby perceive we the love of God, that since God laid down his life for us, the Bible tells us, okay? That is the perception, the understanding of that love came because of this action. This is the reason why God gave man that commandment not to eat of that fruit was not that he shouldn't eat it because something evil would happen. No, something evil would happen, but more than that, that evil would one day be conquered and that which is good would be left, okay? Something good was also gonna happen. That was the end goal, that the good would overwhelm the evil the good would overcome the evil. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. God showed man how to do that by doing it himself. Okay, he overcame that evil by his good. By his good in that man deserved punishment. Man deserved judgment. Man deserved to be killed, destroyed. God didn't do any of those things to him. God, on the other hand, gave his own life and saved man thereby demonstrating to man how much he loved man and man having seen that love, that love having been opened up to him, can now turn around and say, yes, God, I understand that you love me. And because you did this for me, because you saved me from something which I could never have saved myself from, which is this eternal torment of death, I am ever so thankful and grateful and my heart now is filled with the same love that was in your heart for me is now in my heart for you. And now we have a perfect relationship, okay? Now you understand that why these things had to happen the way they happened, that why it was necessary for man to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but at the same time, God had to give him a command not to eat it. I hope it makes sense to you because the Bible makes absolute and perfect sense. Every piece of it fits together like a jigsaw puzzle. There is not one piece that doesn't fit. And in the end, the picture that comes into view is a picture of God who is love. Okay, that's all I have to say about this for now. I'm going to play an old video which I recorded three, four years ago. It was titled, you know, if God is good, why is there evil? Why does evil exist? Okay, so this will be part one. There are more teachings on this very topic, 
which I will uh, post in like part two and three perhaps. But in the meantime, I hope you will study and I hope that God will, you know, bless you with much wisdom and knowledge and revelation in the understanding of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is God in the flesh and whose heart is a heart of love. The access into heart we could have never have had unless our parents, our first parents, Adam and Eve, did what they did in that garden. It was all planned and purposed by God and it has been executed to perfection because God's planning, which is his word, it never returns to him void. It always comes back to him having fulfilled the purposes for which he sent it. And he sent this word before he anything was ever made. And this is now the end of those ages we are living in, where all those plans and purposes that he began to 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 that he put into that he put into motion when in Genesis one one it says in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. From that moment until now, many ages have gone by, and here we are living where we now have a full understanding of the love of our Creator, a love that passes knowledge. Okay, but it is in our heart because God gave his own heart for us, which only became possible because Adam and Eve ate that fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good. Okay, Although sadly it brought the knowledge of evil as well, but the real purpose was to bring us the knowledge of good, to bring us the knowledge of God, to bring us the ultimate knowledge that God is love. Okay, thank you for listening. Hello and welcome. This is Paul Sandhu. My topic for this study today is going to be why does evil exist in God's creation? If God is good, you know, why did he allow evil to come into existence and why does he allow it to continue to exist? So as we understand from scripture that all things were made by God and for God, then it stands to reason that evil must serve a purpose for him. I have spoken on this topic a great deal in many of my videos in the past and uh, those of you who have followed me understand that, you know, this topic is not a new one. It has been discussed in the past. However, in response to a viewer's comments, I want to do a video again on this subject and add more evidence uh, from the Bible that evil was indeed necessary for God to prove something to us, which is namely his love. And without evil, we would have never had a full understanding or comprehension of what this love really means. And that is why evil exists. So the answer has been, uh, this is the short answer. And then I will go into detail and I will show you from the Bible, from scripture, as to why all of this had to have happened the way it has. And let me begin by reading from Ephesians, the book of Ephesians from chapter 3. This is beginning in verse 14. And this is the prayer, the one of the best prayers in the Bible. Uh, any prayer is a good prayer. Okay, there's no such thing as a bad prayer, but uh, in the, in, from that is a, a prayer from Scripture. But, like the Lord's Prayer, for instance. But uh, this, this, uh, this prayer of the Apostle Paul is especially uh, a wonderful and a beautiful prayer because it speaks about the immeasurable love of God. So beginning in verse 14, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and in earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. And I would like to you know, emphasize this uh, clause in verse 19 and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. There are two things in the Bible that we are spoken of which, which exceed our mental comprehension, which we cannot understand. One is the love of God, as we read in verse 19, and to know the love of Christ 
which passes knowledge. And the other one is peace. In Philippians, we can read in the peace which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, our Lord. All right. So this love, if it indeed passes knowledge, it is not something that is easily comprehended or understood. Okay. And according to the scripture, we are never going to fully understand it. But at the very same time, God needed to teach us what this love is. It is not something, you know, that he could have programmed into us. It is something that had to be displayed. It is something that had to be exhibited. It is something that had to be proven to us. And that is the reason why evil and sin and death and corruption and all that is, you know, uh, what we consider to be negative had to come into existence in God's creation and here is why. The reason actually I'm doing this video is because of a comment on uh, one of my videos which I posted earlier in the year titled Gap Theory Proven. And this uh, viewer had uh, written uh, in this comment, so God told Adam and Eve not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but he actually needed them to do it and knew they would, question mark. Then why command them not to and why punish them? I don't understand this. And why does God need evil? If God is omnipotent and omniscient, what is the purpose of all this that you speak about? All right, this is, uh, these questions that this listener has asked is, are good questions, and I would like to answer them here. Now, in my response to one of the other comments that this same viewer had posted, uh, I will uh, post that comment and my response to it as well which was uh, perceived by this viewer to be rather rude. But anyhow, I will explain why I wrote what I did. So it is true that God commanded Adam and Eve not to treat eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, he did. And here is the simple understanding again. This tree was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The conjunction that connects the two words good in and evil is the word and. It does not say, the Bible does not say the tree of the knowledge of good or evil. It says the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And why is that important? It is important because these, the knowledge of these two opposites, good and evil, is intricately linked which means that the knowledge of one cannot come without the knowledge of the other, okay? If the knowledge of one could have come without us understanding the other or its opposite, then this tree would have been called the tree of the knowledge of good or evil, and then, you know, God would not have needed evil because he could have taught us what good was without having to resort to us understanding evil at the same time. For example, like if you want to understand what kindness means, you have to know what cruelty is. Otherwise, there is no reference point by which you will ever be able to understand kindness. It is impossible. Okay? If you want to understand light, you have to understand darkness. And again, without that reference point of darkness, you will never be able to understand light. And this was the problem, even with the angels, who themselves are light, and who stood in God's presence, and who, who knew who watched him create this creation and stretch out the heavens, they themselves sinned against him because they did not comprehend and understand what light was, because they had never seen darkness. Okay, so these things did not happen without reason. They happened because without the understanding of one, the understanding of the other could not come. Without knowing what evil means, we cannot understand what good means, and therefore, we can never understand God. We really couldn't understand Him. Adam and Eve, before they eat this fruit, they could not possibly understand the God on a deep level. They could understand Him superficially, that He was their Creator. They could understand that He had the power to create, uh, you know, the garden that He planted, to, to put the stars in the sun and the sky and all that. But they couldn't understand his character in that he loved them, that he cared for them, that he would do anything for them as far as going to give his own life for them. Okay, that's how great his love for them was. That love was not possible for them to comprehend. 
okay and I will continue talking about this and explain it as we go along but God did command them not to eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil although he needed them to understand these things because if God had told them okay go ahead and eat it okay you've got to understand evil so I'm going to you know, allow you to be exposed to evil and which is going to contaminate you and you're going to become evil and you're going to allow sin and death and corruption to enter into this world. If God had told him to do that, then that would have been, what happened to them would have been God's responsibility. Well, let me just interject here while I'm on this topic and, and explain that good and evil, life and death, uh, you know, light and darkness, love and fear and hatred and death, these things, they cannot be taught academically. They, have only be, they can only be learned by experience. So we, in order for us to understand what good and evil means, we had to experience the goodness of God and we had to experience the evil of the devil. Okay? God is good personified. The devil is evil personified. That is why in that Garden of Eden, what did we have? We had God, we had the devil. We had this tree of the knowledge of good, and we had the same time it brought the knowledge of evil with it. So it was like Pandora's box. Okay, just having everything inside the box did no good. That box had to be opened. And once it was opened, then all manner of evil would flood this world and it would have to be dealt with. But who is it that dealt with it? Was it God or was it man that dealt with the consequences? That is the real question. So let's continue. But if he gave them the command that they shouldn't eat of it, even though he needed them to, and they went ahead and did it anyways, which he knew that they would, then what they did was by their own choice. Right? Do you understand this here? This is a subtle difference, but it's an important one. That by giving them this command, although he needed them to eat of that tree of knowledge, good and evil, he ensured that what they did would be done by their own choice, though they could not turn around and blame God for it. Okay? That is why this command was given them the way it was. Although, without the knowledge of evil, the knowledge of good, and God is good, Jesus said, there is none good save one, which is God. Okay? So, God being absolutely good, he needed his opposite, absolute evil, to exist. And once absolute evil had come into existence, which is the story of the ages that came before Adam, in which evil was born, and it grew, and it grew, and it grew, till it became a full age. And then God could make Adam and put him in the garden, and have this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If evil had not reached full maturity before this time, you know, this tree could not have existed. And that is again like, you know, what uh, you will find in many of my previous videos, such as the one on the gap theory proven, uh, to which I'll put a link in the description. But that is why this happened. That is why this command was given the way it was, that, you know, if they did eat, and he knew that they would, then, they would be responsible for their own actions. And their actions would have some consequences, okay? One of these consequences was that they were going to allow corruption and sin and evil to enter into our world. And when evil enters in, what follows is death, okay? Evil destroys itself and everything in its path. Evil essentially destroys its own host. There is no other way around it. Evil self-destructs in the process of time. That is what death is. When death enters in, it's like a virus entering a person which cannot be removed. And therefore, the end of that body was going to be death. These, this was going to be the consequence. And I'm going to explain now the difference between punishment and consequence. Okay, so let's go back to this comment here. So God told Adam and Eve not to eat of the tree the knowledge of good and evil, but he actually needed them to do to do it and knew that they would question much. So I believe I've answered that question that yes, he did need them to do it. And he had to phrase this question, the command the way he did, because this way it ensured 
that this action would be by their own choice and therefore they would be the ones that would be responsible and they could not hold God responsible for them, you know, eating of this tree, the knowledge of good and evil, which will allow evil to enter into the world. And of course, what would be follow, what would follow would be corruption and death. Okay. Now let's read the other part of this here. Then why command them not to and why punish them? Okay. I told you now already the answer as to why he commanded them not to, because that was the only way it was possible that he could be, he could ascertain that this was going to be their choice and therefore their responsibility for the consequences, not his own. But did he really punish them? This is the part here. And why punish them? Did God punish Adam and Eve? So let me read to you uh, the other comment made by the same viewer, which, which shows the misunderstanding at the very least and the deception that people are under as to what actually happened in that Garden of Eden when Adam and, ate, Adam and Eve actually ate the fruit of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil. So this comment was posted on the video titled uh, Lost Worlds and Forgotten Ages of Men Before Adam. This is another one of the Bible history videos on my Bible history playlist in which I have some 30 plus videos now and I'll put a link to it in the description. So what this uh, viewer wrote in this other comment is, this is the comment that actually, you know, made me indignant, at least like it it, uh, it bothered me that people have such a great misunderstanding, especially Christian people have such a great misunderstanding of their God and as to what he has done for them. Okay, if so God, if, so let me read this comment here. Okay, so if God is omniscient and knew that Adam and Eve and those before would all choose evil and all, that this was all planned, how can sin be held against us okay is sin really held against us is that what the bible teaches how can god love us okay just because there were some consequences you know like when you tell a kid hey don't put your hand in the fire or it'll get burnt and the kid does it and he gets burnt you know does that mean that the parent does not love their child no because the, the, the kid the kid did something wrong how can god love us see how little when when i read you that scripture from ephesians which tells us you know that you can't even comprehend the love of God it is so great yet people have such little comprehension of it because if they understood even like a little bit of this love they would not ask questions like this and you know hey I'm not like trying to denigrate people for asking questions okay because this is there's been so much false teaching on this subject for so many centuries and and millennia that people really have a very confused understanding of why evil exists and why God will allow all these things to happen just understand he is God. Open your eyes. Look at the heavens. Look at the stars. Look at the sun hanging in the sky. Look at the beautiful, you know, I look at my windows, the beautiful breeze blowing through the trees, the grass, you know, it's just everything is so fantastic and wonderful. I look at myself in the mirror and I say, you know, my God, you know, like, the, like David said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. This person who made all this, do you really not think that he would have had a reason for doing the things that have happened? So should we have a little bit of faith? And, and, you know, allow that God, you know, more than us, you know, better than us. So you must have had a reason. Now, let's see if we can understand those reasons why you did the things that we did. But this part here, how can be sin held against us? And look at this. I'll continue reading this. How can God love us? And how, if he loves us, can he send us to a fate akin to trash? Did he send us to a fate akin to trash? Again, false understanding here to be thrown into eternal fire or even just exiled. Did God really do this to us? Did he really throw us into eternal fire? Okay, now that does not mean that there is not going to be eternal judgment, but under what circumstances is that judgment going to be exercised? Those are the things that people have no understanding about. Otherwise, these questions would not arise. And why and how can a perfect being who is purely good create evil? Okay, I answered that question already that without creating evil, without having evil in his creation, we would have never have understood him. And back to omniscience, if he knows the whole outcome, then why is any of this necessary? It is necessary because God wants to have a relationship. He relates to us. But in that is what a relationship is. Relationship is when two parties relate to each other. And a relationship of equals is when they relate to each other equally, mentally, spiritually, physically, that they are equals, okay? So God had to take us 
from this moral, corrupt, limited understanding flesh and blood creature and make us into new creatures who have the mind of Christ, which means they have the mind of God, to have the heart of God, which is a heart of compassion and love. And then we can relate to him as he relates to us. He already loves us. Then we would be able to love him as he loves us. That's why these things had to happen. And in order to teach us, he had to allow us to have this experience of evil. Because as we inflicted our evil upon him, what did he do in return? Did he inflict evil upon us, as this person is trying to suggest? Or did he, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him, whosoever believeth in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Behold, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. Okay? All these things had to happen, but God already bore the consequences. All that evil that would come out of that Pandora's box that was opened by Adam and Eve in that Garden of Eden, God took all that evil upon himself. So, is this sin, was this sin held against us? No, it was not. Okay, I'm going to answer that in detail here. But this question, okay, it really did did bother me that, you know, how can key Christian people have such little understanding of what God has done that they ask such questions that, you know, sin can be held against us. You know, he who knew no sin was made sin for us. Don't they read their Bibles and see that that's what's written in there? That he became our justification. That, you know, he, he was the one that was condemned. The reproaches of him that, you know, the, the, that our reproaches fell upon him, right? Anyways, I'm going to read all those scriptures to you because that's what the Bible is from Genesis to Revelation. It speaks about God taking all this evil and sin upon himself and not letting us be subjected to the consequences of what Adam and Eve did. And why did he not allow them to suffer all the consequences? Well, he didn't because... They didn't know what these consequences would be. They didn't. They had not seen death. They had not seen evil. They had not seen pain. They had not seen suffering. They had not seen disease. They hadn't seen any of those things. Therefore, there was no way for them to understand what was going to happen. But yet God needed for all these things to happen. Therefore, he himself bore our sins from the foundation of the world. Before he even made anything, this was planned, that this is what he would do, that he would suffer those consequences. He would take those punishments upon himself, and he would not punish us. He has not dealt with us according to our iniquities, the Bible tells us. See, folks read their Bible, and they understood what they are saying and believed what is being told us about what God has done. Then they wouldn't ask questions like this. All right, so let's, let's read from Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 32. And this is the time when, uh, you know, this is the time of judgment, and all of the people, all of the nations are going to be gathered before Christ on the day of judgment. And this is what was going to transpire then. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. See, this kingdom was prepared from the foundation of the world. But before we could get to this kingdom, which is the eternal kingdom, before we could get to that stage of that state of immortality and of eternal life and of being the heirs of God's kingdom and being the new creatures in Christ, we had to have this passage through this world of evil. This world of evil was always meant to be a temporary world because, but it is a school, it is the school of hard knocks, which we had to experience, but only momentarily. Like, you know, when the Bible in Romans 8, we read, you know, our sufferings, which are but for a moment, work for us a far greater way to glory, which, you know, you cannot even place a value upon. So, you know, you suffer. Like, just think about this. How long is your life? 
Is it 20, 30, 40, 50, 80 years, 90 years, 100 years, whatever, 120 years, 200 years, 1,000 years? Even if you live that long, compare that to eternity, how long is that in comparison? It is nothing. It is zero. So essentially, anything that we can suffer in this life, it is so brief and so momentary compared to that which is going to happen if you believe in the promise of eternal life in Jesus Christ, if you believe the promise of God and we believe in Jesus, what we will be given is so much greater that you can't even compare them. They are not comparable, okay? And secondly, when somebody is suffering, as for example, by cancer or something, I had somebody very close to me die of cancer a couple of years ago. But you know what? It is not that the person is suffering without God. That pain that that person goes through, it is suffered, all of it, by God. And let me teach you something here, which, you know, especially Christian people have no clue about, that all of the pain, because God knew this was going to happen, okay, before. So he's, like, the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. So he'd already made all the provisions that were necessary to deal with this pain and suffering. All of the pain that has ever been suffered in all creation by any of God's creatures has been suffered by him. All of it. Not just the pain of Jesus Christ dying on the cross. Okay. That was the pain of death that he suffered on that cross. But all the other pain, whether it's a small cut or a stubbed toe or like, you know, the pain of horrific pain of cancer or something like that. All of the pain that has ever been suffered in God's creation because this was what he planned. He did not allow his creatures to suffer Without him, he suffered that himself, and that is what we shall read here in just another moment. Okay, and he shall set his sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared from you, prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger. Look at the personal pronoun here. I, I, I. And this is no allegory, my friends. This is the reality because God in is in his creation and whatever is happening to his creatures is happening to him. For I was in hunger and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger and ye took me in. Naked and ye clothed me. I was sick and ye visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it to me. Okay? There, read that again in verse 40. Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it to me. So whatever happens to God's creatures happens to Him. I'm going to do another video on this, how to teach you how Everything is connected to God. Nothing in God's creation exists outside of the Creator. Nothing. Nothing. Not even the devil. Okay? There is everything is linked to Him. Therefore, whatever is happening to anyone is happening to Him. And when you understand that, then you will understand that, you know, you suffer a little bit of pain. Now imagine God, who has suffered all of the pain, ever suffered or will be suffered in creation until pain is no more. I'm going to uh, read my response to this viewer, you know, about uh, the questions that uh, sin was held against Adam and Eve, that, you know, God didn't love them, that, uh, you know, he condemned them to uh, basically disposed of them as one would dispose of trash, and they were condemned to eternal fire. And all these are incorrect, okay? This is not what God is, and this is not what the Bible teaches. But before I do, let me actually turn to Genesis chapter 3, and then I'm going to show you here, okay? God, Adam and Eve, were they punished for disobeying God? Yes, they were. But what was their punishment? 
Did God chuck them into eternal fire? Did he like, you know, uh, judge them on the spot and, you know, kill them? Did he like, you know, dispose of them as one would dispose of trash? Or did he do quite the opposite? That he actually, in love, restored them or made the way for them to not just be restored back to life, but to go on to something which is far greater, which is equality with himself. So let us first of all look at Genesis chapter 2 verses 15 through 17. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord commanded the man and the Lord God commanded the man saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Okay, so man namely Adam, was given the commandment that he should not eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I explained to you in the beginning as to why this command was given the way it was. And it is also of great deal of interest that this command was not directly given by God to Eve. It was given only to Adam. And that is, an, a, there is a great deal of significance in that, but I'm not going to go into it here as to why it was important that this command was actually given only to one person and not to more than one. Now let's look at Genesis chapter 3. So this command was given, and obviously when a, a command is broken, then there are there is a punishment for breaking the command. So what was the punishment that, that Adam and Eve suffered when they did break the command and they did eat of the fruit of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil? Was it that they were condemned to eternal death? Was it that they were, you know, uh, just disposed of as trash, as no good, as uh, being not loved by God, as uh, as something which are, which, that they were worthless. Is that what happened? Okay, let's look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 16 onwards. Unto the woman he said, this was after they had eaten this fruit, unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee, okay? So what was this woman's punishment? Did she like, you know, fall into hell at that very moment in time? Did she end up in like, you know, roasting in the fire like this woman, in a, this person in her comments suggested that happened? No, God told the woman that her punishment would be that he would greatly multiply her sorrow and her conception in sorrow shall you bring forth children, that there would be not just the pain of childbirth, but as a rule, that the womankind would be subjected to more pain and suffering than the race of man in general. And that is true historically speaking. Women and children basically suffer more than men do. Okay, that's just the way the world is. And this is one of those things that happened because of what Eve did. Okay, this was passed on to all womankind. Now, does that mean that God hates women? Of course he doesn't. He loves them just as much as he loves the males. He loves the females as well because they are all his children. But that is a different subject. I'm digressing a little bit here. And uh, But that is what happened. Her pain in childbirth increased and in her general condition in this world was relegated to one of unequality with the male partner and that's just the way things have historically proven to be right males and females though god made them equal they don't have an equal status or equal you know responsibilities and rights and everything in our world generally speaking and historically speaking that has always been the case so that was the punishment of the woman okay now let us see what the punishment of the man was. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Okay. So Adam's punishment was that he would now have to labor, whereas before, in that Garden of Eden, 
all his provisions, his food, and everything he needed was provided for, now he would have to labor. He would have to work to grow his own food. He would have to sweat it out while he was alive in this world. That was his punishment. And compared to what they brought into this world, which is all manner of evil, of violence, of sickness, of disease, and finally of death, compared to what they did, which as I said, they did not understand what would happen. Their punishment was nothing more than a slap on the wrist. Okay, the woman's punishment was that she would suffer in a childbirth and her suffering generally, her sorrow would multiply in this world while she lived in this body. And for the man that he would, he would be laboring to provide for himself rather than all his provisions being provided for him. That was their punishment. Do you read anywhere here that God threw them into hell or that he, you know, subjected them to eternal fire? Or did he leave them naked and hungry and unclothed? Or did he clothe them with sheeps with the, with the skins, with coat of skins immediately? That even after they were driven out of the garden, they were given all the tools that would be needed. They were taught uh, how to grow food, how to provide for themselves, you know, every part of the way. God had interaction with them. Don't you think that, you know, they just kind of, that that even while they were not in the garden, they were still being provided for? Yes, it was not as easy as it was in the beginning, but at the same time, it wasn't like, you know, an unbearable punishment, was it? Cain was a farmer. He had like, you know, great fields already. Abel was a keeper of sheep and a herdsman already. So they had like, you know, farms and herds and everything given to them almost immediately after coming out of the Garden of Eden. Again, the punishment did not fit the crime. Do you understand? And how did this person conclude that their punishment was death? Their punishment was not death. No sorry. If their punishment had been death, we would all, they would have gone into that eternal fire right there and then and none of us would exist. That consequence, when God said, do not eat this tree, because if you do, you shall die, that was a warning. It was a consequence that would ensue as a result of them eating that fruit of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil. And once the door to evil had been opened, then death would follow. That would be the consequence. It is like, you know, us telling our children, don't put your hand on a hot stove because it will get burnt. And the child goes ahead and does it anyways. What's going to happen? They are going to get burnt. Okay. But that burning is not a punishment. That is a consequence of the child's actions. And death was a consequence that resulted from what Adam and Eve did in that Garden of Eden. When they ate that tree, the knowledge of good and evil and allowed evil in. So the consequence was that death would follow. But that death who stood in between death and the man and saved him from it? Who? Was it man that saved himself or was it God? Do you understand? That God had already saved him from that death even before he died. Therefore, death was not a punishment. Their punishment, as I showed you, were very mild in comparison to what they allowed into this world. So therefore, for people to blame God for death and sickness and disease and all the things that go on in this world, it is not fair. It is not right, especially for Christian people to think like that because God himself bore all of that pain and suffering already even before any of that pain and suffering entered this world. Now let me read to you my response that I wrote to this person and let's see what we can learn from it. Okay, now, before I read my response, uh, let me just uh, say that there's a great deal of confusion on the topic of death. I have done some videos on what death is. And again, I can put a link in the description and I would suggest that you watch those videos, okay? But this question would not arise if people had a proper understanding of what the Bible has to teach about death. 
First of all, the Bible does not just talk about one death. It talks about the second death. And there is a fundamental difference between the first death and the second death. And this question about the lake of fire, as this person asks, and how, if he loves us, can he send us to a fate akin to trash to be thrown into eternal fire or even just exile? This question would not have arisen if they understood that this eternal fire, which is the lake of fire, and the Bible clearly tells us that the lake of fire is the second death. It is not the first death. If they understood that, then they would have known that no man was actually the first death is not the lake of fire. It is not. Okay. And all people have been saved from that first death, which is in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 15, verse 22, we can read, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Now, this is again a topic which I have taught about in the past, but I think I'm going to have to do some more teaching on it, which I will do in part two to this presentation, because I want to end this year with my response to this viewer, and I will continue it in part two, in which I'll explain the difference between the first death and the second death. That the first death, which Adam subjected us all to, Christ saved all of us from it. Adam subjected all of us to that death. Christ saved all of us from that death. Okay? But there is a second death, and there is a lake of fire. There is eternal judgment, and there is eternal punishment. Okay? But who does that? Who are the people that will be subjected to that judgment and that punishment? That is the question. And they were not the people. They were not Adam and Eve. Okay? And that understanding, once we understand that, then we will know that that punishment and that judgment never applied to Adam and Eve. Therefore, we can never say that that was the punishment of Adam and Eve because of what they did in the Garden of Eden, because it was not. So now, like I said, I will answer that more fully in part two, but let me just read my response to what I wrote to this person in regards to these questions and comments that this person had. So my, my response was, ask yourself, who did God punish, us or himself? And then I quoted here from Isaiah 53, beginning in verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. How could God be acquainted with grief unless he had suffered grief? Okay. As I told you in Genesis 6, we can read that the flood came. People keep, you know, again, these false teachings that it came because of the Nephilim, because of, you know, the bloodlines. Nothing of the sort happened. God clearly tells us that the earth was filled with violence. Men were killing men, and that grieved God at his heart, and that was the reason why the flood came. Okay, he is despised and rejected a man, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised. Was Adam and Eve despised? Were Adam and Eve despised? Or was Jesus despised? He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs. Did Adam and Eve have to suffer all of the pain that they brought into this world? No, but he did. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Did they suffer all of the sorrows that they brought into this world? Of course they did not. He did though. Okay. Like I said, people have sorrows. People have pain. But every person that has sorrow and pain is limited. But God's pain and sorrow is unlimited because he suffers all of it. Okay. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Were Adam and Eve smitten of God? No, they were not smitten. They were saved of God. Even in that time, God loved them and he provided for them even though they had to work with their hands, but yet God sent them the rain that was necessary for their crops to grow. He made the sun to shine upon them. He made it still easy 
for them to have everything that they needed in this life and not have to struggle and just to, you know, get a morsel of food. They did not have to. He was smitten of God and afflicted. Who was afflicted? For Adam and Eve afflicted? No, they lived pretty long life. Adam lived to be 930 years, and I'm sure Eve lived somewhere around that time as well. They had plenty of children. They, you know, had a long, long, long life. It seemed to have been uh, all of the necessities of this life, not having been, uh, you know, de not being deprived of them, that they had everything that they needed and more, okay? They were not the ones that were afflicted. So can we say, though, you know, God punished them? Hardly, hardly. Like I said, nothing more than a slap on the wrist. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Okay, so who suffered the punishment for the transgressions, my friend? You ask this question, you know, how could God punish them for the sin? You know, well, who, who was the one that was punished? What does it tell you? Do we not read our Bibles and see what it is telling us? But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Was Adam wounded for our transgressions? Are we wounded for our transgressions? No, we are not. You know, because it says that, you know, we we have, God has not dealt with us in the same measure that our iniquities demand. No way. Not even little, like, you know, as parents, we can understand that. We have children that, that greatly hurt us at many times. They, they cause a lot of pain and grief. And sometimes we do punish them. But do we punish them in measure, in the same, you know, proportion of what they do wrong? Hardly. Most parents do not do that. So he was wounded for our transgressions. So who is it that bore the punishments, my friend? Was it Adam or Eve? Is it you? Or is it God? That question every Christian needs to ask themselves. Who did God punish? Us or himself? He was wounded for our transgressions. Who was in that body of Jesus Christ? God, right? God was in Christ. Is that not what the Bible tells us? So who was wounded for our transgressions and not just who was wounded, who is still wounded every day? What does the Bible teach you? What does Matthew 25 tell us? In that you do it to the least of these, my brethren, you do it to me. I was hungry. I was thirsty. I was in pain. I was in prison. Okay? As people are suffering, God is in them suffering right along with them. So when that person stands before God, anybody that has ever suffered in this life, when they stand before God, no man is going to be able to say to God, God, you don't know what it feels like. You are just, you know, immune from all this. No, sir. He will show you that he not only knows exactly what you suffered, he knows suffering far greater than any individual person will ever suffer in this life far greater, immeasurably greater, infinitely greater. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. So if this iniquity was ours, who took the punishment, us or him? The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. So did God bring punishment or did he bring healing? Did he bring death or did he bring life? Why do we not understand these simple truths as Christians? I'm not speaking here to people who don't know the Bible or who don't believe in Jesus Christ. I'm talking to people who do. Yet they ask such questions as this, you know, you were asked. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, but this stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. Who are the ones that have gone astray? Us. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on us the iniquity of us all. Is that what the Bible says? No. It says the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So this sin that this person said, you know, we are punished for, is that what the Bible says? No, my Bible does not say that we are punished for our sins. On the contrary, my, my Bible says that we are hardly punished for the sins that we are guilty of, that we have actually been acquitted, we have been saved from those sins, those consequences that ought to be a result of that sin, eternal death namely, 
we were not subjected to it. We were all of us saved from it, all of it. Any person that came from Adam and Eve was saved from it. Now, 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 don't get me wrong here. Not everybody will remain saved, which is something I will explain in part two, but yet we were all saved from it because God himself bore that punishment. He has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. Everybody should know this passage by heart. Now I could go on into the New Testament and give you like hundreds of scriptures that talk about God bearing the punishment, Jesus suffering, not us. Jesus saving, not condemning. And yet, you know, the person tells me that, you know, God treated us like trash. No, 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 my friend. You have no understanding of your God or otherwise you would never accuse him of something like that. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are we are healed, all healed even from death. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Why did all this have to happen? Before I finish the rest of the response. Let me give you, which I will speak about and more, John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. How do we prove love? We prove love by giving. Okay, Love is proven by giving. And in the case of the world, people prove love by giving material things. Like a man may buy, like a woman, a nice diamond ring. You know, a rich parent can buy his child like a nice, you know, Mercedes car or something like that, or a Ferrari. Or, you know, give them designer clothes and send them to private schools, etc., etc., that's how, generally speaking, love is proven by the giving of things. But the giving of things then only proves to us things ultimately have really little or no value. Therefore, that love which is expressed by the giving of material things has really no value. That's why, I mean, if, if, uh, if things... If we could understand love by getting things, then the rich people and their kids should be the most loving people in this world. But it's actually the opposite, isn't it? Okay, most rich people are rich kids. You know, they don't have love between each other. Okay, because kids think that their parent, they want something more to be given to them than just things. They want the person to give off themselves to give up their own life if need be, and that would be the evidence of love, not material things. Therefore, God had to orchestrate the situation, create the circumstances that would necessitate that he should lay down his own life to prove to us his love. Jesus said, greater love is no man than this, then a man lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus called us his friends. And then what did he do? He laid down his life. Now, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, before they sinned, before they ate the fruit of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, they had everything given to them. They had a beautiful garden. They had a beautiful place to live. They had all the food that they needed, you know. But did they understand the love of their Creator? No, because God could only give them things, nothing more. Okay? It is when things go wrong that love can be proven. Love cannot be proven in a perfect world. It has to be in an imperfect world. Love cannot be proven to a perfect person. It has to be proven to an imperfect person. So when we became not worthy of God's love, and then God showed his love to us, that is how we understood how great that love is. When we know that we are not worthy of that love, 
that we sinned. We are sinners. We are really, we, we made ourselves worthless, yet God placed a value upon us that can be measured, that cannot be measured in any material terms. Not all the riches in the world could measure that love that he had for us, even when we were not deserving, because we were not perfect, we were not right, we were not, we were disobedient, we were sinful. And you know, God commends his love. In Romans we God commends his love while for us that while we were yet sinners, he sent his son to die for us. Okay? The proof of love can only be given to somebody that is not worthy of love. Think about that. The proof of love can only be given to somebody who is not worthy of love. One more time. The proof of love can only be given to somebody that is not worthy of love. Therefore, we have to become unworthy so God could prove this love to us by not punishing us, by not holding us accountable but not asking us to pay the price, but not asking us to clear the debt that we had incurred, but rather doing all that without even us asking him. Because why? Because he loved us. That was the evidence. If he had not loved us, he couldn't, he could not do it. You cannot die for somebody that you don't love or care for. No, sorry, you won't be able to. So God did all this because he truly and genuinely did love us, okay? Therefore, this question that did God punish Adam and Eve by death, it is it should not even be entered the mind of Christians. Now I understand because of all the false teaching that has gone on, that people think like that. But I think it's time for us to stop doing that. So I'm going to continue with my response, and then I'm going to end this part one, and I'll pick it up in part two. We ought to be careful not to accuse God of something we are guilty of, not God. Did you pay the price of your own sins or did Jesus? Then how can you so callously excuse, accuse God of punishing you? God has not punished us. On the contrary, he himself has borne our punishment. For this, we should be thankful to him, not accuse him. Too many unthankful, ungrateful, unappreciative so-called Christians out there running around blaming God for everything rather than looking at their own selves in the mirror. I will answer your questions in greater detail in a video as to why evil was necessary and who really paid the price for evil, allowing evil into creation, you or God. Okay, you know, when I wrote this year that too many unthankful, ungrateful, unappreciative so-called Christians out there running around blaming God for everything rather than looking at their own selves in the mirror, you know, this person was offended by it. And uh, what can I say? It is the truth, okay? That is why in Christian churches there are more unthankful, ungrateful, unappreciative people than I think there are even in the world. Like, you know, we don't believe what God himself has said. For example, what I read to you from Isaiah 53. And I don't even want to go into all the scriptures in uh in, um, in the New Testament that point to the fact that God hardly punished us. He did not even like, you know, give us little slap on the wrist, I would say, for what we deserved. On the contrary, all he did was shower us with his love. You know, he, 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 he stretches out his hands to us and say, come to me. You know, I love you. Believe me, I have already paid the price for what you have done wrong. I have settled your debts, just like if your child went and took on a debt, gambling debt of 100000 or 200000 or a million dollars or $10,000, dollars does not matter the amount. And, you know, you as a parent went and paid that debt and you told the child, you know, I have paid that debt. Don't. You did wrong. Forget about it. You've done it. Now come to me and I will give you real riches and real life and real value okay that's what god did he paid the debt without even us asking for it he forgave our sins even before we knew what sin was he loved us before we even knew who god was and he paid that price 
did we have to go and ask him? Did any of us go and ask him, you know, pay my price for my sins? Or was it already done even before you were born, even before the foundation of the world? Does that not prove the love of God? Does that not prove that these things had to happen the way they did for God to show and commend the word commend in Romans 5? God commends his love toward us. It means to prove it, to exhibit it, to put it on display, to show us so that we could learn who God is. And then once we do, we would be able to love him. That's why these things happen the day, way they did, that we can relate to him as an equal to love him equally as he loves us. Otherwise, we would have never been able to. So these things had to happen the way they did. Evil had to exist. And the history of the ages and the worlds that have come and gone, before God made Adam, which I've spoken about a great deal, it is the history of the birth, the growth, and the maturing of evil. That's why those worlds were necessary. That's why worlds did exist before this present one. That's why history goes back a lot further than the 6,000 years of so or so since Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. It's a lot older than that. It's in the Bible. And when we study it, we understand it. What do we, whose understanding do we receive? We come to understand our God. Then we become thankful. Then we become grateful. Then we become appreciative. As Christians, we ought to be in our faces day and night just thanking him because he is thankworthy. He really is. You know, we should, we really should love him because there is no one that is more loving than he is. There's no one that is more, there's no earthly parent is as kind as he is or as forgiving as he is or as gentle as he is or as merciful as he is, as loving and kind as he is. No one. This teaching was originally recorded in two parts, and uh, what follows now is part two of Why is there evil in God's creation? A few days ago, I posted a video titled, Why does evil exist in God's creation? And that was part one. So this video now will be part two. Actually, I had originally recorded these uh, videos uh, quite a few years ago titled, if God is good, why does evil exist in his creation? And uh, I'm just adding an introduction to part two of that series from four, three, four years ago. And I will be posting that video shortly after my, right after my introduction. And the answer to the question, you know, why evil is quite simple. It can be summed up in one word. Actually, the whole Bible can be summed up in one word. And that word is the word conscience. So let me just go ahead and begin by defining the word conscience as it is generally understood and also from the Bible. Okay, the conscience is the faculty that man possesses to discern between good and evil and therefore the ability to make moral choices of good, evil, right, wrong, etc. Okay, in the Bible, in the New Testament, this is the word G4893. Okay, this is the word conscience, and the, it is the Greek word soon e they sees. Okay, e they is the word idea, so that implies knowledge. Okay, so this definition of uh, this is the Greek word, and the strong concordance is G4893. And from the word study dictionary, I'm uh, reading this definition. I'm going to read a part of this definition. It says, The faculty of the soul which distinguishes between right and wrong and prompts one to choose the former and to avoid the latter. I think it's a little bit more than that, and I would also disagree with this definition in that in that, that I do not believe conscience is just a faculty of the soul. I would say it's more a faculty of the spirit, okay? It's something which is a spirit, is a, it's a spiritual force. That's literally what a conscience is. It is not just being able to understand math or physics or, or uh, you know, some kind of biology or something like that. It is, it is to understand the spiritual forces of good and evil, of God and the devil, who are both spirit. And therefore, it is, it is something that is more to do with our spirit than it does with the soul. However, it is correct that it is the faculty which uh, distinguishes between good and evil. They say between right and wrong, and most of these definitions, they leave out good and evil. 
But literally, you cannot define conscience without good and evil. This is where Genesis 2, you know, where God planted the tree, the knowledge of good and evil. What do you think, like, you know, God, uh, you know, just wanted to play some games or whatever? Of course not. There was a very specific purpose why the tree, you know, the knowledge of good and evil was there. And that was that it would be something that would be instrumental in uh, making man a creature of conscience without which he could never be a creature that could understand his maker, his creator, and could never have a relationship with God. He would always, it would be impossible for him to understand God because, here, look at this definition. Conscience is a moral awareness that springs from and is conditioned by one's knowledge of God and his duties to him. So without having the knowledge of God, number one, God is good. So without having the knowledge of good, you cannot have the knowledge of God. And without having the knowledge of God, that God is good, man can never be good, and he could never have a relationship with him. Adam and Eve were not good. That doesn't mean they were evil before they ate the fruit. They were neither. They were neither good nor evil. They were more or less like robotic, okay? They had a personality because every person that's created by God has a personality. But personality is not spirituality, okay? Spirituality comes from the knowledge of good and evil, the knowledge of God and of the devil. Now, the problem is that God wanted man to have the knowledge of himself, okay? Because without that knowledge, they could never be anything more than mere robotic creatures, without the knowledge of good, without understanding that God is good, that God is kind, that God is merciful, that God is forgiving, ultimately that God is love. Okay, they couldn't understand those things. But in order to bring him that knowledge of good, it was also required that he understand evil because good can only be understand it, understood by contrasting it to evil. Light can only be understood by contrasting it to darkness. Life can only be understood by contrasting it to death. So all these things needed to happen. So what God basically did was that God allowed man to become evil by his own choice, which is very important as I explained in part one of this uh, series. And then when evil had entered into man fully, within eight generations we read in Genesis 6 that the thoughts of the intents of the heart of man were only evil continually. That's it, man had become fully evil within a period of just eight generations. Evil had fully entered into him. He had become full darkness. He had become full evil. Okay? So, God literally had to destroy that world because that evil had grown so rapidly and so much in man. Okay? That he was nothing but evil. He was literally like walking devils in the flesh. That's what happened. So, so the purpose of introducing man to evil, allowing him to become evil, happened quite rapidly. But after that, all through the time that they left that garden, the goal had always been to bring them the knowledge of good, to bring them the knowledge of God. Now that they had understood evil perfectly, God began to show them his goodness. He began to forgive them. He began to be kind to them. He began to be merciful to them. He began to, you know, give them blessings rather than curses. Okay, he took to, 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 to give them benefits rather than judgment. So all these things happened to man. And as it happened, it started bringing man the knowledge of God. So then we got to Deuteronomy and God had given them his law, which explained to them through things like the Ten Commandments of what is good and what is evil. And then you could tell them, okay, now I'm setting before you life and good. Life is good, see? I'm setting before you good and life, death and evil. Evil is death, good is life. Evil is the devil, good is God. Okay? Life is God. The devil is death. All these things were opposites with God created in this world, allowed to exist in this world, including the devil who was evil personified, and therefore man could have the knowledge of both. Now the problem was once evil entered into man, man could never again become good. He couldn't, okay? Therefore, God would have to 
take it upon himself to do the impossible and to remove that evil out of him and overwrite it with his own good. And that, my friends, is the meaning of Hebrews 9.14, which tells us how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Okay, it is only the blood of Christ that is the only ink that exists that can overwrite the evil that is in the heart of man. And this is how God planned it. First man's heart would become evil. Read that in Genesis 6. The, the, the thoughts of the heart of man were only evil continually. So man's heart had become evil. Now, an evil heart is not what God wanted. He was not going to have a relationship with an evil heart. Okay, he wanted somebody to be good, somebody that could understand him, somebody that could love him as he loved them by understanding his love. And to do that, he had to transform them in their conscience. So the conscience, as far as from a biblical perspective, it does not just mean the ability to be able to tell the difference between good and evil. It means that man should have a good conscience and a person with a good conscience like God cannot even be tempted with evil so that any choice that that person is going to make, make is always going to be good, so much so that it is not even a choice. Like Jesus, when he was tempted, you know, it wasn't a choice for him, oh, should I take the kingdoms that he's offering me? No, it was not. It was not even a choice. It was just the choice was, get thee behind me, Satan. These things mean nothing to me. I don't even, they, 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 they cannot even tempt me. Okay, and this is what God cannot be tempted with evil. For God to have a perfect relationship with any creature of his, that creature would need to be perfect in conscience. That creature would need to have a perfect knowledge of God, of the heart of God, of the heart of God, which is that it is a heart of love. Hereby perceive ye the love of God, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our life for our friends. Okay, you can read that in 1 John 3, 16. So God had to bring us that understanding of his love and that understanding of love could only come through having death in this world. God, by conquering death, by defeating death through his love, showed to us what love is and how greatly he loves us. And now, hereby perceive you that we love God because he first loved us and he showed us that love. So now we can love him. Now the purpose for which we have been created, it can be fulfilled by the purging of that evil from our conscience by the blood of Jesus Christ to perfect that conscience so that as that evil is overwritten, what is it going to be overwritten with? It is going to be overwritten with good. As the death that's in there is overwritten, what is it going to be overwritten with? It is going to be overwritten with love. As the hatred and fear that's in the heart, when it's overwritten, what is it going to be overwritten with? It is going to be overwritten with the love of God. And when that writing is completed, as God tells us in Hebrews in particular, I will put my laws into your mind and write them on your heart. And then he says, not only do that, I will also put them in your heart and I'll write them in your mind so that I'll cover all the bases. You will become perfect because you will not even be able to be tempted with evil. In order for that to happen, man first had to become evil and that evil had to be purged out of him. And the only way to purge that was through the blood of Jesus Christ, which is the pure ink. It is pure life, therefore it can overwrite any evil. Evil means death. Any death, any corruption that's in there can be overridden by that blood and by that blood only. And then when man's conscience becomes perfect, man begins to understand God perfectly. And therefore, they can have a perfect relationship. God wanted a family. That's why he created us, right? We are called the sons of God. And more than that, we are called the bride of God. Okay? I mean, to have a relationship as a bride, I mean, that is like unbelievable. Okay? So that is, that is only possible when it is a relationship of love. And this is only possible because there was that tree in that garden called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There was that creature in there called the serpent, the devil, who was purely evil. And God was there. And the tree was there to bring us the knowledge of good. Sadly, it would also bring the knowledge of evil at the same time. But God had already made the provisions. God had already planned how he would rectify the death 
and the corruption and the sin and the and the, and the darkness and the and and the hatred and the killing and the murder and all the things that would come because of the knowledge of evil he had already behold the lamb of god slain from the foundation of the world okay it had already been done all planned and the plans went according to his plans everything has happened so that's my friends is the reason why evil exists this was sorry just a little bit of a long introduction now you can watch the rest of the video and hopefully it'll give you a better understanding of what conscience is and it'll give you a better understanding of what god is doing with you he literally copying himself onto your heart and mind copying his conscience into us making us perfectly good so that we can't even think evil we can't do evil evil has no meaning for us anymore none of that stuff that is evil will be has any attraction whatsoever for us it's 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 impossible it is not even that we have to choose evil we will become like god where evil is not even a choice anymore that's how great the work has been done by the blood of christ okay so i hope uh, you will all study this information and i pray god that he will open up your hearts and minds and write that in knowledge of himself on there purge your conscience from evil and stop doing dead works and go and serve the living god thank you for listening this is paul sandu greetings to all in the name of our lord jesus christ the name which is above all names to whom has been given all power in heaven and in earth in the bible god is called omnipotent so all power belonged to him and all power comes from him however in his wisdom he has allowed this power to be challenged challenged by the power of evil and it is by overcoming that evil that he can now rightfully lay claim to this power as being his because all challenges to it have been put down why did god want this to happen he wanted this to happen he wanted this power to be challenged he wanted something that opposed him an opposite of himself to come into existence god is good so he wanted the opposite of evil to come into existence the reason is why last week i did uh, part 1 of this video if if a series if god is good why does evil exist so this is now a continuation of that study in part 2 in order to understand why evil exists in god's creation if god is good it uh, becomes necessary to understand that the not anything that has happened in creation has happened because god has planned it to happen that way okay so god planned for evil to come into existence this is god's planning otherwise it would not have come into existence and why would god do that god is uh, but the jesus the bible tells us and jesus said that god alone is good meaning that god is absolutely good in him there is not even an iota of evil so this is a paradox you know how could a god that is absolutely good you know plan for and allow the evil existence of evil to uh, evil to come into existence and the very very short answer to that is that god wanted to show to all his creatures especially to man who was chosen for a very very special purpose to be the offspring and the heirs of god to show them what power really is and ultimately power is love that is godly power all the other powers they are equated with destruction you know how big of a gun can you have how big of a bomb can you make okay god's power lies not in showing that he is able to destroy but god's power lay in proving to us that he is able to save and that is only possible if he is love if god was not love he would not have been able to save us and that is the short answer so in order to prove the power of his love god's love Okay, God's love is entirely different than human love. In order to prove this love, God had to create a challenge to that love, and He had to create challengers that would challenge Him. And the challenge that would be laid down would be the challenge of death. Death was the enemy. Evil always ends in death. Okay, evil begins however it begins, but the end of evil is always death. And death is something which it is an enemy that is equally strong as love in so- in, in the song of solomon in uh, chapter 8 verse 6 we can read love is strong as death okay so god created an enemy that was equal and opposite to the power of his love and that enemy is death so god very patiently and over eons of time allowed evil not just to be born 
but gave it time for it to grow and finally for it to become absolute. An absolute evil personified is that creature whom we know as the devil or Satan. Okay, So once absolute evil had come into existence in God's creation, then formed God the man, Adam, and placed him in the Garden of Eden. And this is where this battle between love and death would begin. Okay, This was the beginning, Act 1, where this man, Adam, was placed in between two absolutes, the absolute of God and the devil, the absolute of good and evil, the absolute of life and death. That is the real story of the Garden of Eden and of the two trees in particular that were in that garden that God planted, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. So this was all going to lead up to the time when love and death would clash and that clash would finally take place on the cross of Jesus Christ. And once love and death had clashed, it was love that would arise victorious. And that is how God proved to all of his creation, but particularly to man, the power of his love. Because it is only because he loved that much that he was able to conquer death for all of us. That is how we have come to understand the love of God. That is how this love was demonstrated to us on the cross of Christ. That is how it was proven to us. The proof of this love was given. Without this proof being given to us, we would have never understood the love of God. Okay, And love is a product of a good conscience. Okay, Unless a person's conscience is pure and good like that of God, a person can never love like God. Therefore, when God set about to begin this creation with the intent that he was going to create for himself a family, an offspring, children, sons, daughters that would have the same power of love residing in them. He had to make it possible to, for their conscience to be also pure and undefiled like his own. However, this process could only be completed by first allowing them to acquire a conscience, which is to acquire the knowledge of good and evil. And when they did, then their conscience would automatically be defiled. It would become impure. And then he had the way, he had to make the way for that conscience to be purged for their conscience to be purified, for their conscience to once again be undefiled like his own, for then they would become perfected in love. So today I'm going to talk about the subject of conscience a great deal. I'm going to talk about programming because the conscience is something that is programmed into us. And I will be speaking about the two great and opposite programmers, God, and the devil. And then you will understand why the devil exists, why evil exists, why death exists, and thankfully not forever. So today I'm going to change and to speak about uh, something which is very rarely taught in uh, biblical, in Christianity, in, uh, in, in what's uh, mainstream Christianity, which is the topic of conscience. As a matter of fact, I really have not heard any preacher ever talk about this subject, and this is the very heart and the very soul of the Bible. This is the very real reason why God did all the things that he did, because in order for him to have offspring that were the same as him, he needed to program them with his own conscience, okay? And today I'll be talking about the word programming and also about programmers, not just a single programmer, God, but also his opposite programmer, which is the devil or Satan. So conscience is a faculty that is programmed within us by our experiences of both good and evil. Okay. Now keep in mind that it is the experiences of good and evil that teach us what good and evil mean. 
It is not something that you can send a kid to school and show him in a chalkboard, you know, what is good and what is evil. Yes, you can give them some uh, academic knowledge, but it's not until people have experienced what good is, so that good things have happened to them or evil things have happened to them that they will understand what those things mean. See, people are born with a personality. God programs a personality to people. Some are like, you know, very jovial. Some are very serious and somber. You know, so everybody has a different personality, which comes, which is given to us by God. So people are born with a personality, but they acquire a conscience through their life experiences of good and evil. And it is this topic of conscience, how a conscience more than a conscience, even your consciousness, which is, uh, which is uh, you know, your mental faculties, how they are programmed into us. That is what the whole heart of the Bible is. And that is when we begin to understand good and evil. And that is when we begin to understand God and understand why it was necessary for him to have evil exist in his creation. Okay, first of all, we need to understand something, which is the concept of absolutes. When it comes to God, when it comes to good and evil, these are absolutes when it comes to light and darkness, for example, which means that they have no overlapping between them, that there are no grace. When, it, when the Bible says that God is good, it means that he is absolutely good. When it says he is light, it means he's absolute light without any darkness. As a matter of fact, we can read in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Okay, God is life, which means there is no death in him at all. Life and death, light and darkness, good and evil, God and the devil, these are absolutes. And until we learn to think in about these these uh, characteristics and these personalities, God and the devil, in terms of absolutes, we will never be able to understand what good and evil is because we live in a world in which both of these exist and we are so conditioned to believe in graves in relative terms that we think that even if God is good, he's got to have a little bit of evil in him or if the devil is evil, he's got to have a little bit of good in him. No, God does not have any evil and the devil does not have any good. It has to be like that. So just like God is an absolute that uh, can be defined in terms of everything that is good. He is good. He is life. He is light. You know, he is love. God has this own opposite and God planned on bringing this opposite into existence. And this opposite of God is the person. He is, he is personified by the devil or Satan. So Satan is evil. Satan is darkness. Satan is death. Satan is the opposite of God. He is the one that was chosen to stand in opposition to God so that on that cross, it would be Satan's death that would clash with God's love. And then it is the one that will stand victorious that would be the ultimate power. And it is through this clash, through this, uh, through this uh, showdown, let's say, that we have come to understand that the greatest of greatest of these, as the Bible tells us, or greatest of the powers that exist, is the power of love. And who is love? It is God. Therefore, who is the most high and the greatest of all? It is God. It has brought us this understanding, which is how our own self is programmed, our conscience is programmed with the good of God, with his love of God. So this is what transforms us from mere mortal corrupt flesh and blood beings to immortal good and perfected in love God beings. So in order for God to create a God being, he had to first, like I said, program us with his own conscience, okay? So where there is a programming, there are, of course, programmers. And since the programming of conscience involves both good and evil, there have to be two great programmers. God, who is good, has always existed. So there was, not, there was no need for God to bring himself into existence, since, like I said, he is self-existence. He has always existed. He is not subject to time. So his time, his, his existence cannot be understood in terms of time in that he does not have a beginning. He is the one that has begun time. All right, now... The devil, on the other hand, was also necessary. Evil was necessary. He is the great programmer that would program God's creatures with evil. And in the process of time, 
God would purge that evil out of his chosen creatures, and by so doing, he would transform them into his own species, into his own kind, and therefore they would be qualified to be his children, and more importantly, to be his heirs, and be creatures that could relate to their creator on an equal level, which is the level of love. So essentially, they would be able to love their creator just as much as he loves them. And thus, this relationship would be a complete one. A complete relationship is one in which both parties love each other equally. And this is not possible. This type of love was not possible for any of God's creatures to show towards their creator. It was not possible for the angels, and it was not possible for flesh and blood men until this love had been literally the, the programming of a conscience, essentially a good conscience, I should say, is the programming of love. And it is God who had to write that program, and that program was written in his own blood. And in order for that blood to be shed, there had to be a shatter of that blood, and that shatter of blood is, of course, Satan the devil. And this is why Satan was necessary to exist, because it is the shedding of that blood which showed us, which proved to us the love that the Creator had for his creatures, particularly for man, because if he had not loved them, he would not have been able to die for them. So a man's education or man's programming, man's uh, you know, the, the writing of his heart, let's say, with the blood of Jesus Christ, it begins, the story begins a long, long, long time before man was ever made, okay, because the history of evil predates the existence of Adam by eons, by ages, by how long it is in terms of years and days, I have no idea, it could be like, you know, tens of thousands of years it could be millions of years or even longer. We don't know that, okay? But this story began a long time ago, but all according to God's plan. But as far as we are concerned, we meaning modern man, and by modern man I mean those people who are descended from Adam and Eve and in the Garden of Eden, these, their education, their programming began in that garden in which we can read in Genesis chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, that the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay. So these trees are, of course, representative of the two great absolutes and opposites. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is very easy to understand. You know, good and evil are opposites. The tree of life, on the other hand, also signified an opposite without which it really served no purpose. And that, of course, is the opposite of death. Because it is only in the presence of death that this tree would have value. So here we have this stage set with these two absolutes. Okay, good and evil, life and death in the same place. And what does God do? He takes man and he puts him in the middle of these two absolutes. And these two absolutes, like I said, they are personified by these two persons. One is God and the other one is devil. So God literally put man in between himself and the devil, in between good and evil, in between life and death. And then he was required to make a choice. And why was he required to make a choice? He was required to make a choice because... At that point in time, man did not have a conscience. This will be very difficult for many people to understand, but actually it's not. It's rather simple. What is a conscience? As I defined it in the beginning, that it is that faculty by which we discern or we differentiate between good and evil. Now, if Adam and Eve, the first two humans, our first two parents, if they did not have any knowledge of good and they did not have any knowledge of evil, they could not have had a conscience. Very easy to understand. So the first step in this process of the perfecting of their conscience to be identical to his own conscience, God had to 
activate this faculty that they were born with, which is that they had this faculty which would make it possible for them to understand good and evil. But until they started experiencing good and evil, that faculty would not be activated and they would not become creatures of conscience. So the button that was pushed to activate this conscious, this faculty of conscience, was the eating of the fruit of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden. That is when the man's education, man's programming began as far as his spiritual side is concerned. That was the moment when man finally started his journey to becoming a spiritual creature rather than just a carnal soul creature as he was before that time. Because it is a conscience that makes us spiritual. An evil conscience will make people spiritually evil. A good conscience will make people spiritually good. Okay? So the first step was for them to eat this fruit. It was necessary for them to do that. Because if they had not done that, they could not have become creatures of conscience. And the process of perfecting them in love could not have been even begun, let alone be finished, okay? As Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. And what was finished was this work that began, you know, in that garden, which was that they would now be creatures that would be capable of having the same conscience as that of their creator, which is a perfect, pure, and undefiled conscience, okay? So essentially, for this education, God literally had to hand them over to the devil, or they had to hand themselves over to the devil. I should rephrase that. It serves God's purposes for them to be handed over to the devil so that they could receive an education in evil. Okay, But if God had told them that this is, you know, you go ahead and you start doing evil things, then that would have made God evil. Okay, And he couldn't do that. This is the reason why God in his wisdom gave them the one commandment that they knew, that he knew that they needed to break. But without them breaking that commandment and doing this by their own choice, they would not have been responsible for their actions. But if God gave them a commandment and said, don't eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they went ahead and did it anyways, which he knew that they would, then it would serve God's purposes, but at the same time, they could not be held responsible. They could not hold God responsible because he did not ask them to do it. He, On the contrary, he gave them the opposite commandment that they should not do it. Okay, So, therefore, they themselves were responsible for their own actions. So what I'm saying here is that it was necessary for them to become literally slaves to evil, slaves to the devil for a while. And God would eventually liberate and free them from it. But they had to do so by their own choice. So they could not blame God for what happened to them. So again, I'm repeating myself here, but get this understanding that God needed them to eat this fruit of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, because that is the only way they could, their consciences could be activated. And then in the process of time, these consciences would be programmed, first by the programmer of evil, which is Satan, okay? He would teach them everything that is evil, you know, lust and murder and hatred and envy and jealousy and, you know, all the evil things, greed and uh desiring material things rather than spiritual and eternal things. All these, all this knowledge of evil would come to them from the devil. So their conscience that will first be programmed would be by the programming of evil. This also was necessary. Okay? This was necessary. And why was this necessary? It was necessary because... Without first understanding and experiencing evil, they could not have understood good to begin with. Secondly, if they had never had that experience of evil, they were always in danger. They would always be in danger that at some point in time in the future, they would turn to evil. 
just like the angels did. God gave the angels a lot of power. He gave them a lot of knowledge. And eventually some of them turned to evil because knowledge without love, knowledge without the knowledge of love and the understanding of love and being perfected in love will always be used for evil purposes in the end. Power that is not the power of love will always turn to evil. This was proven in God's creation by his angels. It was proven by the men that he made before Adam. It was proven in history that this is what happens, okay? Therefore, man had to first experience evil and become evil. So in the process of time, God would purge that evil out of him. He would purge that evil conscience. And what would remain then would be the good. And then man would become immune to evil forever, like God is immune to evil. This, what happened in the garden with the arrival of evil, with the programming of evil, with the, with the consequences of evil, it was necessary, but it was an immunization program. The, 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 the concept of immunizations, okay, vaccines, whether they work or not is not the issue here. Okay, whether they're good or evil is not what I'm debating here. But the concept is based on this, that, you know, you introduce a disease into a person's body so that they will become immune to that disease. And this is exactly what God did. He introduced evil into us so that eventually by removing that evil, he would make us immune to evil. Why does it make to us immune to evil? I don't really have the answer to that question at this moment, okay? Maybe in the future, God will explain it to me why it is only by purging evil out of a person that a person can be made completely immune to evil. But that is what needed to happen. Okay, so this is the reason why God had that opposite and absolute of his own self, the great programmer of evil, Satan, present in that garden. He was there. Okay, and that was his job, that he was going to program mankind with his evil. And then God would in the process of time challenge that devil and he would defeat him by his love so that programming of evil can only be overwritten by the programming of love. And when the programming, there's my answer, I think, why this had to happen that way, that when that programming of love has been written on our heart, then that programming of evil can never be rewritten on it. And that is what makes a perfect creature a God creature, a God being, a God child, a God offspring, a begotten son of God is one who, like God, is absolutely good. But that could only happen when that programming of love had been written on his heart. And that programming of love can only be written by removing the evil. We do the evil, God comes with his good, and he removes that. Because in Romans 5, we can read, God commends approves his love for us that in when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, okay? So this sin and evil had to be present in us because God could show us his love. He could program us with his love, which it was not possible for him to do in the Garden of Eden when everything was perfect. I said this in my last video, that it is not possible to prove love in a perfect world. In a world where nobody needs anything, everything is already provided for, there is no need for sacrifice. And without sacrifice, without the act of giving, love cannot be proven. John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave. The gift that he gave was his life. That is what showed us the magnitude of his love. The gift that he gave us was not a lot of fruits to eat or a lot of, you know, clothes to wear. The gift that he gave was the most precious gift that he had, which was that of his own love. Now ask yourself this here, if evil did not exist, if sin and death did not exist, how could possibly God have given that gift to us? Could he have done so? Of course he could not have done so. Now do you understand why evil had to have existed? It had to have existed, first of all, for God to prove his love to us by giving us the gift of his life, okay? And secondly, by so doing, by so doing, he programs us with his own love. Those of us who believe in him, those of us who understand that he loves us, that love 
despite all the evil that we have done or can do, we understand that that program is working in us, that God is not imputing our sins to us. He is not taking account of our iniquities. He is not keeping track of the evil that we do, but rather, despite all of that, he loves us. And that love is the program that writes us with a pure conscience. This was made possible by the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. There is one verse in the Bible, which is the very heart of the Bible, and that verse is Hebrews 9, 14. And how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience. What does it say? Purge your conscience. That blood had to purge the conscience. If that blood was shed when the conscience was not defiled, it would serve no purpose. But on a evil, defiled conscience, when that blood is applied to it, it is that ink. It is the ink of love that begins to reprogram us. It begins to deprogram us from the evil and reprogram us with the good. You see the wisdom of God in here? Do you see the planning of God? Do you see that nothing happened by accident, that nothing is random, nothing is without reason or without cause, that God did all these things by his own desire and by his own plan and by his own power without any of us asking us to do that because he is love and being love, he loved us, okay? Now, before he created any of us, God being love, he loved. He knew how to love, but he had no one to love. And that was the whole purpose of creating us and creation in general, that he would then have people that he could love and that would love him back. That is how a relationship becomes a relationship that is complete when it is completely based and founded on love not just human love. Humans fall in and out of love, you know, at the drop of a hat. Not so. Not so with God's love. God's love never fails. When he loves you, he loves you. He'll never let go of you. And when we get a hold of that, when that programming of his love is complete in us, then we turn around and do the same for him. We love him back. And then God gives us everything that he has. He has no fear. He has no, like, you know, he's not he, he doesn't have any concern that we're going to turn and become evil towards him at some point in time. He knows that, you know, without because we love him as much as he loves us, that will never happen because love is not evil. Love has no evil. Love cannot be overcome by evil that was proven on the cross of Christ. And when that love is perfected in our heart, we will never again be overcome by evil. Just think of that for a minute. You know, we all know like all the things that we have done wrong and that we do wrong. That, you know, we are, in Hebrews 12, it tells us, you know, that the way to sin does so easily beset us. We know that in this world. But God is not going to leave us in that state. He is going to, he who began a good work in us will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And that work will be finished in us. And we will be able to love our Creator just as much as He loves us. And then we will relate to Him as equals. Okay, we will have a relationship of love with Him, a relationship which can never be broken. And therefore, God will elevate us to come and sit on His throne with Him. He will make us His kings and priests because we will be worthy. And we became worthy because God was able to program his good conscience into us. This is no small task, my friend. It was a near impossible thing to do, but God did it because nothing shall be impossible for him. Now I'm going to stop this here because I think I've given you so much meat that you will need to chew on this for possibly years before some of you will get it. But I pray and hope that everybody that listens to this will study this topic of conscience. We study like, you know, what it means to have our consciences purged and what was the process that God used to do it and what is the real power in the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, you go to some Pentecostal churches and they talk about the blood of Jesus Christ, blood of Jesus Christ. 
No, the blood of Jesus Christ is the ink that purges your conscience. That's its real power. And when that conscience is purged, your heart becomes a heart of love. Just think about that. God takes that ink of the blood and he's writing on his heart. And what he's writing on it is love. It's a beautiful love story, my friends. It is the love of your creator for you, his creation. That is what the Bible is all about. And if you don't see it, if you just see like, you know, judgment and God is hard and he's doing this, you have missed it completely because God's the word. There is a compound word in the King James Bible. This was specially invented for describe something about God because we didn't have such a word in English. That word is a word loving kindness. It's a compound of love and kindness. That's who God is, love and kindness. He did not he did not treat us. He did not, you know, execute his wrath and judgment upon us when we were fully, fully deserving of it. But he gave us the gift of his own life to save us. Like I told you, the power of love is in salvation. It is in saving. Love saves. Love saves. Love saves. Evil destroys. Okay? Death destroys. Life gives. God gave man life in the Garden of Eden, right? Before, when God formed man, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and he gave him life. And that process had not stopped. The life that he has in store for us is even much greater than that life. It is so great that I can't even, I have no clue as to how great that is going to be. And the person that I'm going to be, that God is working on and forming inside of me every day, he changes me, he's tweaking in it, that programming is ongoing, and he is programming my heart with this love. And for that, I love him back. And that is the purpose for which he created us, to be his lovers, okay, to love him as he loves us, and to have a relationship with him, which no other creature, not the angels, not the beast, no one else can have, which is an equal relationship of love. I really hope you get it, okay? So thank you for listening. Well, I do want to also say something, which I'm going to have to continue this year. We're going to do one more part. I have talked about this in the in, in the past, but it is related, which is the topic of death, okay? In the Bible, there are two deaths, the first death and the second death. And there is a very great and significant difference between them, and that is related to this topic of good and evil. I would like to provide some more understanding for you on that topic, and I will do so in another video in the coming days, okay? But thank you for listening. God bless you all. I pray that, you know, as you study, that you will really be approved of God, and you will begin to, this, 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 these words that I speak will become revelation in your heart as they have in mind, and you will glorify your God. You will thank him. You will, because you will understand him. And when you do, you know, that's all you can say is thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus, because I understand now what you did for me. And it is so much greater than anything I was ever taught in my life before. Thank you for listening. This is Paul Sandhu. <laughs>
It's gonna take some dying Dear Lord, see my Peace.